Welcome to another wonderful episode of At Home with APS Summer Edition. My name is Miss Maggie. And I'm Miss Mary. And we are joining you for our third week where we are working on animals within our state. We've been talking a little bit about this throughout this week, and we're going to continue that for the next couple of days. Before we get started though, Miss Mary, I think you have another shout out to our wonderful librarians. I do. I have a message to the students at one of our schools. Now, you all will have to bear with me because there are some long names in here and I have to really take my time so that I, I don't get all tongue twisted. So hang on for a second while I just take a look. So first of all, the name of the school. So if you are a student at Trace Volcanoes Community Collaborative School, listen up. This is your message from your two school librarians, Mr. B and Mrs. Cardi. And they say, we miss all of our magma mites and we can't wait to see everybody in August. And they want to remind you, don't forget to participate in our summer reading bingo and keep reading. Perfect. I think you said the majority of actually all of those words. Great. <laughs> Got through it. So let's go ahead and let's tune in to our essential question for this week that we've been working on. What animals live in New Mexico? So if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, we started off in that small area of our own homes. What animals were our pets? And then we broaden our circle out to what, what kinds of farm animals are there. And now we're expanding even further to the animals that are in our own state. So, Miss Mary, I took some of the pictures that you showed us about habitats yesterday, and we're going to do a little bit of a matching in terms of figuring out what animals belong in which of those habitats. Oh, now, I feel like I'm going to give away the answer to the question that you, that you had for us yesterday. But that's okay, because do you remember this question that we had yesterday? Mm -hmm. We left you with the question, which habitats are in New Mexico? So we'll answer that now. Absolutely. But could you answer that right now? We talked about a few different habitats. We talked about tundra. Mm -hmm. We talked about grasslands, mm -hmm. deserts aquatic, which means water habitats, yes. and forest. Yes, those were the five that we had. Now, interestingly enough, even though the primary climate of New Mexico is a desert, New Mexico actually has all of those habitats. Really? Yes. It was super exciting to learn about as I was putting together these pictures because I was able to find that type of climate, that type of habitat in every part of New Mexico, even at least the, in some part. Even the tundra? Yes, even the tundra. That is so interesting. I can't wait to find out more. Perfect. Wow, we live in such a neat state. So let's start off with the forest. In the forest, we have so many different animals, but I picked two animals and we are going to discuss and make inferences using the images to figure out which of these animals live in a forest habitat in New Mexico. Oh, so there's the key there. It has to be an animal in New Mexico. Yes. Now, can we just go back for a second? You used a word mm -hmm. that I know we've used before, mm -hmm. inferences. Mm-hmm. Let's discuss that a little bit. What do you mean by inferences? Well, what I mean by inferences is that oftentimes we can create thoughts and ideas based off of text, based off of images, or based off of what we've already learned in our own background knowledge. Got it. And so that's what we're gonna be doing today with this activity is continuing to build that background knowledge by making inferences from the images. Okay. 
So let's take a look here. On this left-hand side, I have a picture of a black bear. Then on the other side, on the right side of the screen, I have a picture of a black and white panda bear. Now, thinking back to our background knowledge of what we know about black bears and panda bears, which animal will most likely live in a forest in New Mexico? What do you think, Miss Mary? Well, for one thing, my hometown is in the mountains. Mm -hmm. I was born and raised in northern New Mexico, Taos, Santa Fe. Those were the, the towns in which I grew up. And we saw one of these animals quite a bit. Hmm. Which one was it? It was the black bear. That's right. Now, while many of us at least know what a panda bear is, panda bears are not native or naturally born in New Mexico. They're born in other parts of the world. Well, and that makes sense because I've seen panda bears in zoos mm -hmm. and on programs such as National Geographic, but not in our forest. Exactly. So out of these two choices, the black bear is in the forest. Let's try another one. So here we have the most typical habitat that we see around New Mexico, and that is a desert. Now we have two different types of animals that could possibly belong in the New Mexican desert. Let's see if we can use our background knowledge and our images to help us figure out which one belongs in the desert. This first one here on the left-hand side, this is a Gila monster. And the Gila monster is a reptile. It is a lizard. On the right-hand side here, we have an Arctic hare. And the Arctic hare is this little white bunny that is right here on the right-hand corner. So thinking about those two animals, which one is most likely to live in our New Mexico desert? Well, in looking at these two animals mm -hmm. and pulling from my background knowledge, mm -hmm. I know that one of the ways that animals keep safe is by camouflaging mm -hmm. themselves in the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. I think that the Arctic hare would have a very hard time camouflaging in this type of environment because it would really stand out with that white against this background of browns and greens. Mm -hmm. But looking at the Gila monster, I think that this would really blend in well mm -hmm. to this type of habitat. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna guess that the Gila monster, the lizard, is the one that is native to New Mexico. That's right. The Gila monster definitely lives in a desert area like this. And for some people that may be hiking out in these desert areas, they might even see one. But be careful, you never, you never want to disturb an animal living in their natural habitat. No. Let's try another. Now, this is the tundra. Now, Miss Mary, I took this picture from the images that you had, and this is the picture that most closely looks like the tundra that we have here in New Mexico, and that is the Sierra Blanca Alpine Tundra, and it's by Ruidoso, New Mexico. Ah, okay, that makes a lot of sense because Ruidoso tends to be a little bit cooler, well, mm -hmm. sometimes quite a bit cooler yes. than we are here in this part of the state. It's in the southern part of the state. Yes, and it's going to be found mostly at the very top of the mountains. Is that going to be that climate that you're looking for? Okay. So we have two pictures of two animals that might live in the alpine tundra. The first picture on the left-hand side is an elk with his long horns, kind of looks like a deer. Mm -hmm. And then this 
and I might give the answer away with this, but I'm hoping it'll help all of our students at home. This is a lemur from Madagascar. So out of these two animals, which one most likely belongs in the alpine tundra? Well, I actually know a lot about Rudoso because our family is from that area. Mm -hmm. We have a cabin that we go visit and I've seen elk. So that is an easy one for me. And also because when my boys were young, we used to watch a program with a lemur from Madagascar. And so my background knowledge helps me to answer that question. Mm -hmm. I know that Madagascar is an African island. Mm -hmm. That's right. So also, one of the clues that I gave in there was that I was very specific to name where that lemur was from. So even if you didn't have that background knowledge, students, the way that Miss Mary has her background knowledge, by listening to how people are speaking, you can also make inferences as to which one belongs in that environment. Now we have grassland. In New Mexico, we have a couple of different grasslands. One that is that spans over a couple of different states, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma. And then we also have a couple that are in the southern area of the state as well. And so in the grassland, this one's gonna be really easy for you students, I think. We either have a bison, which is on the left-hand side, or a dolphin, which is on the right-hand side. Let's have you try. Which animal belongs in the grassland? That's right. The bison belongs in the grassland. Now, I purposefully made this one a little bit easier to tell just from looking at the images because not everybody has that background knowledge of living in a New Mexico grassland. And so being able to look at the images and seeing which one looks most like an animal that would live in a grassland, even just looking at the background of the image. That's true, because I can tell that this animal actually lives in water. Mm -hmm. And most of us probably know dolphins live in oceans. Yes. And we don't have an ocean here. No. Now, our last one is aquatic. And I hope you'll pay attention to these two animals that I'm gonna talk about here because they're gonna come up again in just a second. This first animal here, this is a sandhill crane. And if you just take a quick look at the background image here, you can kind of see where that sandhill crane lives. Then we have the peacock. Now, some of our students in New Mexico might actually have a lot of experiences with peacocks because they happen to live in the North Valley of Albuquerque. And you can actually see them sometimes in the morning wandering around the arroyos and the, and the sidewalks. That's true, I see them every morning on my walk. Yep. Yeah. So now, let's think, which one is most likely to belong in an aquarium? aquatic habitat. Now, remember, aquatic means water. Which one belongs in that water habitat? That's right. The sandhill crane belongs in that aquatic environment. Miss Mary, for our students at home, how do you think they were able to figure out that the sandhill crane lived in the aquatic environment. Well, I think that they were probably able to make an inference mm -hmm. based on the picture. If we look at this picture, the crane is standing mm -hmm. in water. Exactly. So now let's keep that idea of making inferences in mind as we read aloud a story from this collection of fables from Us Born Books. Now, this story is called The Peacock and the Crane. Oh, that's why you were telling us to pay attention to those two animals. 
That's right. Oftentimes, when we read fables, they have a message that they're trying to teach us using a story with animals in them. And so in this particular story, we're going to learn a lesson from the peacock and the crane. And because those are actually based on real animals. Now, this story is written by Susanna Davidson, or actually retold by Susanna Davidson, and it was illustrated by Giuliano Ferri. And it's in this collection of the Usborne Illustrated Stories from Aesop. Here is the story. Now, I'm going to be reading this story rather than going through the pictures because this is actually the only picture in okay. the story. So for our listeners at home, not every book or story has pictures. Sometimes we have to rely on our imaginations, our visualizations, to figure out what is happening in the story so we can make those inferences. As we go through this story, Miss Mary, I'm going to be making inferences while I read. And I'm going to think about what I read and create an idea from what I just read. You think they can do it, Miss Mary? Oh, I know they can. All right, let's listen to the peacock and the crane. Peacock strutted beside the river, the blue feathers on his body dazzling as the, as the sun dappled water. Behind him, sashaying along the ground as if it had a life of its own, came his long and splendid tail. The crane watched the peacock from the riverbed, admiring his beauty. Peacock looked back at her with scorn. Okay. Can I just say, yes. I love a word in there. What's your favorite word? Oh, this word, sashaying. What do you visualize when oh, something is sashaying? It just gives me such a picture. A sashay is sort of, sort of like this, this walk, right? It's not just oh, walking, yeah. it's sashaying. Yeah, it's almost like gliding. Gliding, yes, mm -hmm. that's a great word for it. Okay, sorry to interrupt the story. No, I think that's great that you're sharing your visualizations with us. I've never seen such knock knees, Peacock mocked. You must be so embarrassed. I'm surprised you don't make more effort to hide them. And as for your feathers, you poor dear, so dull. As he spoke, Peacock opened his tail feathers so they rose up around him like a halo. The crane was almost overcome by their beauty. The feathers shone bronze and green and blue, forming a pattern of a hundred unblinking, iridescent eyes. My feathers could make a cloak fit for a princess, Peacock boasted, a fan for an empress or a coverlet for a queen. How you must envy me. Look at your wings, so plain and white. You'll never be as beautiful as me. Now, I'm going to pause for a second and I'm going to make an inference based on what I've already read from the text. And from the text, it does not sound like Peacock is very nice to Crane. Hmm. And I think that because one of the things I heard Peacock say to Crane was that you must be so embarrassed. That's not a very nice thing to say. And the peacock told Crane that her feathers were very dull. That also wasn't very nice. You know, as you were reading, mm -hmm. when you read those sentences, I just had the worst feeling. It mm -hmm. made me feel so bad. Mm -hmm. And now as you're talking about how those words helped you to make inferences, mm -hmm. I think that's why it made me feel so bad inside mm -hmm. because those words helped me to see what was happening between these two characters, and I felt really badly for Crane. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and let's continue the story. I hope, I, hope that, I, I hope that maybe things change. Me too. Okay. Crane bowed her head. It's true, she thought to herself. No one gasps in pleasure as I walk by. I am nothing compared to Peacock. 
nothing. Crane watched Peacock all day as if by watching him, she might grow more beautiful too. And as night fell, she saw Peacock circling beneath a tree. Then with a jump and a great flap of his wings, Peacock struggled up to roost on a low slung branch. Crane swooped over to sit by his side. Why do you rest here? She asked. This branch is so low. Won't you be safer sleeping higher up in the tree? I can't fly any higher, replied Peacock haughtily. My tail weighs me down. You can't fly any higher, repeated Crane, sounding shocked. Why would I want to, said Peacock with a shrug. I'm safe enough up here. So you've never flown up to look at the stars, asked Crane, or soared across the sky at sunset? No, snapped Peacock. Anyway, I don't need to look at the stars or the sunset. If I want to see something beautiful, all I need to do is gaze at my own reflection. How proud and arrogant he is, thought Crane. Now, during this whole story, Miss Mary, so far, I felt bad for Crane because she felt bad about herself. And I inferred from the text when the author described how Crane wanted beautiful feathers like Peacock, she was actually feeling bad about herself. That's how I got that inference. But now, based on what she just said about how proud and arrogant Peacock is, I'm inferring that Crane realizes that Peacock's personality may not be so kind. Mm -hmm. Now, let's continue on. She smiled. I don't think I envy you after all, she said. My feathers may not be beautiful like yours, but at least I can use them to fly. How dare you speak to me like that, cried Peacock. I dare, because for all your beauty, you're no better than a chicken in a farmyard, said Crane. You're forever stuck on the ground while I can soar up to the stars. Moral, fine feathers don't make a fine bird. Now, I'm inferring that by the end of this story, Crane is starting to see her own value and her own worth rather than trying to look like Peacock. And I'm really proud of Crane for that. I felt much better by the end of the story. In fact, I noticed that I, at the beginning, I was feeling very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I was uncomfortable because, as you pointed out, we were making or drawing inferences yes. based on the words that they were using about how they felt. Mm -hmm. And I felt badly for Crane because she wasn't feeling good about herself. Exactly. And then my feelings started to change mm -hmm. about midway through the story when mm -hmm. she, as you pointed out, started to see her own value. Yes. And saw that she could do things that Peacock couldn't do. Exactly. Now, let's go ahead and let's move forward. We're going to practice a couple of high frequency words that came from the story. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a sentence and I'm going to repeat it. Okay. Now, for today, I'm going to write out the sentence as I say it, and I want all of our students to be looking for that high frequency word. Got it. So I'm going to go ahead and get my writing utensils up here. And here's the sentence. Peacock thinks he is beautiful because of his feathers. So I'm going to repeat that. Peacock mm -hmm. thinks he is beautiful because of his feathers. That's right. So peacock, here's the word peacock from the story, thinks. And I hope our students are noticing that as I'm writing, I'm writing from left to right. I also noticed that she has already used a couple of digraphs which we've been learning about in phonics. Those are the two letters that go together to make the same sound. Mm -hmm. I see a CK there. I see a TH there. That's right. So Peacock thinks he is beautiful because of 
his feathers. Now that is a long sentence. And I actually see a few different high frequency words. Now, boys and girls, let's talk about what high frequency words are again for just a moment while Miss Maggie finishes up this sentence. Remember, high frequency words are those words that pop up a lot in our reading, but they don't always follow the rules that we're learning in phonics. In my class, when I was teaching kindergarten first, well, I, I still teach those, but when I was a classroom teacher, mm -hmm. I used the word popcorn words when we saw those words because of mm -hmm. how much they pop up when we're reading. Mm -hmm. So now in thinking about this, the word that we're looking for today is because. And here is that word right here. And boy, that is a word that we use a lot. It definitely is. So this is the word because. Now, I would like everybody to say the word because. because. Now, we're going to skywrite this word. So if you remember how to skywrite, we stand up, we put up our arm, and we get ready to write each letter just like how the word looks. If it helps you, point at the screen to spell out each word. Ready? Here we go. B, e, e C, A, U, S, E, because. That's the word because. Let's try another. The next one that we're going to do is this sentence here. Okay. I can go to the stars, said Crane. Let's repeat that one more time. I can go to the stars, said Crane. Now, I can go to the stars, said Crane. Got it. Then I come back all the way here to the left-hand side to keep writing my sentence. Now, our high frequency word is going to be the word said. Miss Mary, do you already see that word said? I do see it. And it's such an important word mm -hmm. because it tells us when a character is saying something. Absolutely. And I see it right there. Perfect. Now, I also see that it has an A-I, which we learned about yesterday mm -hmm. when we were focusing on our two vowel teams, A-I and A-Y. Yes. But this doesn't say said. No, it does not. So that means it's a rule breaker. Exactly. This word does not follow the typical rules. And it's just a word that we have to learn how to spell and memorize. So let's go ahead and let's practice that spelling by skywriting. Great. Ready? Arms up. Here we go. S-A-I-D said. The word is said. Let's try one more. The sentence is, Crane was sad for her feathers. Crane was sad for her feathers. I remember we used four last week as a popcorn word. That's right. Let's see if we can find this next high frequency word. The word is was. Now I see it and I can hear the w in it. Mm -hmm. So I know that it's here. Now I think a lot of our students mm -hmm. would hear that and probably tap it. Mm -hmm. W-uh-z. And they might spell it W-U-Z. 
Exactly. Which is how it sounds. Mm -hmm. And we know that the actual spelling is W-A-S. That's right. So this is the word was. Let's skywrite it. Ready? Here we go. W-A-S. Was. That's the word was. Now, let's go ahead and let's keep this on back, the back burner just for a little while because we're going to practice this again on Thursday. Now, our three words again were because, because said, was. was. That's right. Now, let's go ahead and we are going to practice some vocabulary with multiple meaning words. Okay. A lot of words in the English language have multiple meanings, which means they have more than one definition based on, based on how we use it in the sentence. So, for example, the word proud has multiple definitions, and we're going to look at three of those definitions today. Great. And we'll follow the typical routine that we've done before. We'll define it. We'll give an example, and then we'll ask you at home to think about the word as well. So let's try the first one. The first definition of proud means feeling pleased or happy or worthy because of something that you own or that you've done. Okay. Here's an example of that. I am proud that I graduated college. That's an example of feeling proud. Now, for our listeners at home, our students, what is something that you are proud of, that you feel happy about? Miss Mary, would you share an example that maybe you have as we're thinking about it? Sure. You know, when I think about something that I'm proud of, mm -hmm. I think what I'm most proud of mm -hmm. is that I have raised two boys who have turned into amazing people. That's a wonderful thing to be proud of. Now, let's take a look at the second definition. Okay. The second definition is having respect for your own independence or your own worth. So, an example might be, the proud woman did not want help from anyone else to fix her computer. She wanted to do it herself because she was proud. Now, when was a time that you might have been too proud to ask for help? Hmm, that's a little bit harder for me because it is. I pretty much ask for help as soon as I need it. I'm not too shy about asking for help. Um, you know, recently mm -hmm. I had a hard time asking for help putting all the books away in the library because we got so many books back at the end of the year mm -hmm. and it was hard for me to ask for help because I wanted to do it myself. Yes. But then I realized I really needed help because it was such a big job. Exactly. So I'm glad I wasn't too proud to ask for help. Excellent. Students at home, can you think of an example when you were, you might have been too proud to ask for help, that you wanted to do it just on your own? That's right. There's a lot of different examples. Now, let's try the last one. The last one is having too high of an opinion about your own self. Here's an example. The peacock was very proud because of his long, beautiful feathers. So thinking about that, how did peacock act proud around crane, having that high opinion of himself? I remember there was a word in there that I really liked, mm -hmm. that word sashaying, mm -hmm. which sort of means a special sort of walk. I think that word gave us a clue because he was walking in a very special way saying, hey, look at me. That's right. So in thinking about that, there were a lot of different ways that Peacock acted proud around Crane because of the feathers, 
because of the sashaying. Can you think of an example at home? That's right. There were so many different ways that Peacock acted proud around Crane. So now, based off of what we read in the story for the word proud, and we have all these definitions of proud, which one sounded the most like Peacock? How it was used in the story? What do you think at home? That's right, the third one. Peacock had too high of an opinion of himself. And that led to that moral of the story, fine feathers don't make a fine bird. You know, that's interesting how proud can mean so many different things mm -hmm. with just one word. You really have to sort of listen to the way that it's being used mm -hmm. to decide what it means. Exactly. Context with multiple meaning words is very important. And this is a concept that you will come through many times in your academic lives as you read your different books. Because proud is not the only word that has multiple meanings. Hmm. Now, in thinking about that, let's come back to our story map about the story of the peacock and the crane. And this is going to be important because it's going to help us with our type of writing for today. Okay. Now, I have this story map here that talks about the title, the setting, our characters, events, and of course, our moral of the story. Now, a lot of the stories that we've read, we've really focused on that idea about sequence of events. What happens? Who are the characters? What's the setting? But this is a little bit new, mm -hmm. this moral. It's a central message. And a central message, a moral, is the lesson you learn from the story. Miss Mary, do you remember what the lesson was from our story? Well, I remember that Crane started to feel better about herself Mm -hmm. when she realized she didn't need to look mm -hmm. beautiful because fine feathers and now I forget the actual wording. Can you help me, Miss Maggie? Absolutely. Fine feathers don't make a fine bird. That was it. I was thinking fine feathers don't make a fine fellow. Because that's probably something that I've heard before. It makes more sense that in this story, fine feathers don't make a fine bird. Now, in thinking about the central message, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're only talking about birds, cranes and peacocks. A central message is really a lesson that we can take and we can put into our own lives. Mm. So, for example, when we say fine feathers don't make a fine bird, we're not only talking about birds. We're also talking about thinking about how people look and that just because a person may look a certain way doesn't mean that they're a nice person or a bad person, that the two don't necessarily always equal up. Just because something is beautiful doesn't necessarily mean that it's kind kind of reminds me of that saying, beauty on the outside doesn't make beauty on the inside. That's right. And that's what this fable is teaching us. Now, in a fable, they automatically put the moral in there so we don't have to guess at it. But a lot of stories actually don't. They're trying to teach us a lesson, but they won't announce it or put it at the in, into the story the way a fable does. So then what do we do? How do we figure out a lesson if it's not automatically put into the book? I think I know where you're going with this. Where do you think, Miss Mary? I think we have to make inferences to try to come up with what the story is teaching us. That's right. So we have to think about who our characters are, which are Peacock and Crane.
we have to think of where they're at, which is they're by a pond. And we have to think about how, what happens to them and how they respond to each other. So if we think about the first thing that happens in that story, we remember that Peacock was essentially showing off his feathers. Mm. So Peacock showed off his feathers. I had a very clear picture of that happening in the beginning of the story because some of those words that the author wrote helped me to paint a picture in my mind or visualize what was happening. Now, how did Crane respond to that when Peacock was showing off his feathers? Well, I remember feeling really badly for Crane. So I remember that Crane responded by thinking that she wasn't as good mm -hmm. as Peacock or as beautiful as Peacock. So I'm going to put that Crane felt bad about herself. Ooh, mm -hmm. that was a That's an easy way of putting it. But then as the story went on, something changed. Something had to happen to make a change in Crane. And I, what was that? Yeah, I remember that part again because my feelings changed. Mm -hmm. And I remember that I started feeling better because Crane was feeling better about herself. Mm -hmm. That was the point at which she saw that Peacock couldn't fly up high into the tree. So Peacock could not fly into the tree. Do you remember that part? He had to sit down on the lower branches because he couldn't go up so high. The tree. And then, so then because Peacock could not fly into the tree, how did Crane respond to that? That was when Crane said, oh, actually, you're, you're not as, as good as I thought. Mm -hmm. So then Crane felt better about herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember at that point, I felt relieved. Mm -hmm. that Crane felt good about herself again because she should have felt good about herself and what she could do. So now, Miss Mary, if you, if you take a look at this, this entire story is about how the characters respond to the things that are happening in the story. They connect with each other. This is what happens when we do our own story writing. Right. We make connections from one thing to the other, kind of like in yesterday's story, the coyote who swallowed a flea, all the different things that happened were connected one thing to the next thing. Exactly. So in thinking about that, that is how we work on our own idea of a narrative. And so narratives are a different type of writing, Miss Mary. They are a type of writing that have a beginning, a middle, and the end, and they tell a connected story. So the first week that mm -hmm. we were doing Summer at Home with mm -hmm. APS, we wrote opinion writing, mm -hmm. and then we did information writing. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going to do narrative writing. Exactly. And narrative writing is a little bit trickier in terms of the structure. Okay. Because the most important thing in narrative writing is not necessarily the actual outline of it, but it's more about how you are telling your story. How do you want people to react to your story? How do you want characters to act in your story? Or at least that's, that's what I believe about narratives. Did you want to add more to that? No, I, I, I'm just thinking through, if I were to write a narrative, mm -hmm. what would I write about? 
And how, well, I'd have to, of course, be thinking about my story elements. Mm -hmm. So characters, setting, and then that plot, the events yes. that happen, and putting them in a sequence or mm -hmm. in an order that makes sense. Mm -hmm. As soon as you started talking about writing, I started thinking, hmm, what would I write about? Exactly. And one of the one of the easiest ways, well, not easiest necessarily, but one of the ways that we can start with narrative writing is about thinking about our own stories, our own experiences. Think about a time when you went to a grown up or you went to a friend and you told them a story about something that happened to you. You had to tell them who was involved. You had to tell them where it happened. And you had to tell them in a certain sequence what exactly happened in the story. And that's kind of like our story map here, is that plan of writing. Where is it happening? Who was involved? And what are the events that took place? Now, for our students that are from kindergarten and first grade, this might be as simple as telling a story to an adult in your home or an older or an older sibling and having them help you write the story by just writing down what you said and then you can add in the drawing. For some of our older students, that might mean now starting to write down what's happening in each part and then adding in that creativity, those details that really make your story come alive. So Ms. Mary, what are some ways that we can make stories come alive? Well, for one thing, I noticed in the story that you read mm -hmm. that the author chose some really interesting words. Mm, yes. So that helped me to create pictures in my mind of what was happening. Exactly. Kind of like how we talked a couple of weeks ago about different ways for the word said, like grumble, shouted. Oh, that was a fun lesson. We talked about different interesting words that we could use to really show what was happening. Hmm. I wonder what are some other ways that we can make our stories come alive? Well, one thing that we've been practicing is talking as if we were characters. Yes. So maybe having the characters say things that's right, because characters don't just stand in a story and just kind of go through each event without saying anything or feeling anything or thinking anything. They are actively involved in every single action that happens. So characters say things, they feel things, and they think things different ideas. And you just got me thinking about something else. The characters interact. Yes, exactly. And so characters have to interact with each other. And that's how we really communicate well in our writing. And so as you're becoming a creative writer with this narrative, you want to be able to share a story where your characters interact with each other where they go through a sequence of events and that you use interesting words to communicate that. I do have one more thing that I wanted to add in talking about narratives as well. There's always something that happens here at the beginning that gets our characters started. There's either a situation or a problem that they have to solve or they have to go through in order to get to the ending of their story. And that's kind of what they had done in this story here in the peacock and the crane, is that the peacock actually started walking by the river, showing their feathers. That was the situation. And the problem came when peacock was unkind to Crane. That's how a lot of our stories start off. 
Interesting. So as I, as, as you've been talking, mm -hmm. I've gone through a couple of different possibilities for a story that I could write mm -hmm. and helping me to come up with a final choice yes. is really focusing on when did I have a problem and how did I solve that problem? Mm -hmm. Okay. That could be a great way to get started. And there's so many different types of narratives out there. You really have tons of different options that you could look to for ideas. For example, we use the peacock and the crane as an example to help us talk about what do narratives have. Many of the books in your own home are great examples of stories and narratives that you could use as an idea to jumpstart your own story. For example, I'm going to share a little story that I that I have here. So I'm working with a I'm working with a student right now, and he and I have actually been writing a story together. And it's a little story, it's a short story. We actually have been writing about a monkey and a banana. Just something off of our imaginations. And the problem that we started off with in this story is that the monkey wants to eat the banana, but the banana wants to, wants to actually be friends with the monkey and play tag with him. That would be a problem. It definitely would be a problem. And so when we worked together, we were actually to come up with a series of events, a sequence where the problem ended with a solution where the monkey and the banana do become friends at the end. And that's how narratives work. Now, I'm sure all of you have noticed at home, we actually didn't write anything down for our draft today because we want to leave this, create, this creative project up to you and your stories and your experiences and letting you share your ideas with the world. So when we come back on Thursday, we'll have an example of something that we have written but we want you to be able to apply the lessons to your own story as well. Because it's important for you to share your, your knowledge with the world. Now, one thing that you can do is something that Miss Maggie already talked about, which is to tell your stories. Mm -hmm. Start off before you even get started with writing, mm -hmm. start talking about things. And then as you talk through your story, you'll come up with something that you're ready to write. Absolutely. So, Miss Mary, we did so much wonderful stuff in our lesson today. We got to talk a lot about the different habitats in New Mexico and the kinds of animals that lives in those habitats. We read a wonderful fable and learned a very good lesson from that fable. Then we shared some high frequency words, we learned about multiple meaning words and vocabulary. We talked about the central message from a story. And then we talked about how we could take what we learned from stories and put that into our own narrative writing. So we did a lot today. There was a lot. And you know what? I, one thing that I really enjoyed from today's list lesson was listening to the story of Aesop's fable and not going off of the illustrations or the pictures, I was able to create my own pictures because of the words that the author used. Exactly, and that's what we do as we get older as writers. Or I'm sorry, as readers, my apologies. As readers, eventually we don't rely so much on the pictures as we do the text and what we're hearing and what we're reading. And so that's, that's, a, good thing to, that's a good thing to think about, Miss Mary. The other thing that I noticed is how my emotions were going along with the mm -hmm. story. And I think that that was also from the inferences that I was making as I listened. Absolutely. Now, a lot of the work that we did today can be continued at home at your own pace, writing your own stories, working with finding the central message, so on and so forth, even practicing those high frequency words. Now, you can find the lesson that we just did today on the APS YouTube channel if you happen to miss it on the KNME um, show. Now, we want to once again thank you all for joining us today for At Home with APS. This has been Miss Maggie and Miss Mary. We're going to see you again soon. Have a great day. Bye.